My name's Bernie Jones. Um, Bernie Jones Sr. What was a typical day like for you at Robert Moton High School? A typical day at our high school, we started off in the morning with a morning devotion, a prayer, and pledge allegiance to the flag, and then we'd do a song. And usually there was competition between uh, homerooms as to who could sound the best when singing. All right. Can you tell us about your favorite teacher and what made him or her so special to you? My favorite teacher would have been Lewis Kane. Lewis Kane was our uh, math teacher and music teacher, and he also assisted uh, with the athletic phys ed department. And the reason why he was my favorite teacher uh, was because I liked math and I liked to sing. And we always, every morning, we would sing very well, very loud, and we were always competitive. Who was your least favorite teacher and why? I can't say that there was a least favorite. Uh, I liked all my teachers uh, because they taught us how to be young individuals and they were concerned about us. They wanted us to learn how to learn and how to go forward and to the world and be successful. Uh, I think Miss Harris was probably the strictest teacher, uh, but later on in life, uh, I would say she was the teacher that I would think did the most for me. What were the major differences between black and white schools during segregation? From my perspective, the major differences were the books we received. Our books were always secondhand, half the pages were missing, uh, there were always graffiti written in them. Uh, we didn't have uh, every, our school wasn't air conditioned, first of all. We had to open the windows to get air conditioned when it was hot. Uh, our gym was used as dual purposes, a gym, auditorium, classroom, uh, whatever. So I guess not being able to go to white schools to visualize or see what they were like, I couldn't make a direct comparison because the only time we went to white schools were when we played them in basketball and soccer. And the only time we played them in basketball probably was my last year or two in high school. Therefore, I never really got into a white school. During desegregation in Carroll County, how would you describe the transition into integrated schools? And what experiences or events stand out in your mind? Well, I wasn't in Carroll County during the transgression from uh, segregated schools to integrated schools. I left Carroll County in 1960. Now, the first schools to integrate probably were the elementary schools back in 55, 56. Uh, but I wasn't part of that. Therefore, when I left Carroll County in 1960, all the schools, uh, high schools, were still segregated, except for Francis Scott Key. I think uh, that, that was the newest school built in the county, and that was the first high school to start segregation. So I was not a part of that. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you. My pleasure. Can you give us your name? Yes, my name is uh, Bernard Jones. They call me Bernie Jones. I've been back in the county since 1969. Is there anything you would want to add that we didn't ask you? Well, I, I think Carroll County has changed a lot uh, through the transgression of the open-minded people that we had in Carroll County, in particular, uh, our Zepp, uh, Bob Scott, uh, uh, those two people stand out in my mind because they were very instrumental in helping to change the way Carroll County were. And I think that was important, uh, particularly Bob Scott, because he was instrumental in helping me to become the first African American to serve on a bank board in the county. And without his assistance and persistence, uh, that would not have happened. And I think that in itself has made a big difference in Carroll County. And he also, when uh, I understand I wasn't a part of it, but when they went to Washington for the march, ours up, Bob Scott and their wives, they participated in that. So individuals like that, uh, John Lewis, uh, George Collins, they were all instrumental in making changes in Carroll County. And I take my hat off to them. Well, what do you remember about your neighbors growing up in your neighborhood? 
Okay. About my neighbors in Carroll County. Well, when I grew up in Carroll County, we lived on a dirt road and we played in the road because she didn't play in people's yards. Yards were sacred. So the neighbors, you know, they were all good neighbors. You knew all your neighbors. We didn't have that many. Uh, but they all looked out for you. If something went on, if one kid was crying, they'd come over and find out what was wrong. And they looked out for each other. What did you do for entertainment as a child and also as a young adult? Entertainment, we played ball in the road. <laughs> and most of the time we spent looking for the ball in the weeds <laughs> because it wasn't that much of an open area. Uh, we played with our neighbors, you know, we would play ball, we would play with the girls, we'd play house, mother and father, typical kids games. Uh, as we got older, we got bicycles and we would ride our bicycles, but, you know, we didn't have much of a lot of toys. So we learned to be innovative. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you spent with your chores. I mean, you had to get wood in for the fire. Uh, you know, you had to cut grass, uh, pull weeds out of the garden. So you, you learn how to be helpful and useful to the family. It wasn't all playtime. Were you, um, when you were attending school, what were some of the favorite activities that um, the children liked to do at recess time or, or after or before school? Well, before school, there wasn't much to do because we were, when you got to school, you probably had five or ten minutes before school took in. So there was, there weren't uh, a bunch of before or after school activities. When school was over, you got right on the bus and came home. Uh, during the day, we played soccer. Uh, we had little softball teams. Uh, in the wintertime, you could go in the gym and play basketball. Uh, our class, we liked to sing, so we would do a lot of singing. Our, we prided ourselves on being very vocal and very good. Uh, when, I guess in the middle 50s, they started uh, a glee club and then they started a county chorus. Uh, so, you know, we were all pumped up to be a part of the county chorus. So they took so many students from each high school and they had called it in Stedford and you sang an opera. So that was a highlight of our time, you know, just being able to participate and go to Western Maryland College and sing in a big auditorium. Uh, to us, that was huge. What do you see as the most um, difference between African American youth today as opposed to when you grew up? I think the biggest difference in today's time is the opportunities that are available to African Americans for any minority uh, child. The opportunities are just unreal. There, there's just so many. Uh, I would think that it's a challenge as to being able to select what you want to do. There's nothing you can't do. Uh, when we were coming up, uh, the only jobs that we could get in the summer, you know, you could work for the nursery pulling weeds or you could get a job cutting grass, but you, know, you never got to work in a grocery store bagging groceries or, or work in uh, G.C. Murphy's, anything like that. It was always labor type work, where the kids today, they can do almost anything. You know, they get the jobs in banks working as tellers, they can work in the hospitals uh, as, I think, orderlies or pinkies or whatever they call them. They're, it's just insurmountable the opportunities uh, that they have. They can go to summer school, you know. We never had summer school. I mean, if you were failing, you just failed. We're in today, if you fail, you have an opportunity to make it up. If you're bright enough, you can go to summer school and take extra credit. So there's not a reason for any minority student, any student, not being able to progress. I, I think one of the problems in my estimation, is just so many opportunities that children don't take advantage of it and they just squander their time rather than being focused. And how have things changed in Carroll County since you were young? 
Well, I just explained to you how a lot of things have changed. The opportunities in Carroll County are so much more. You can live anywhere. If you have the money, you can live anywhere you want. Where before uh, you were discriminated, you weren't even offered the opportunity to live in different places. Uh, you can work wherever you want. Uh, so those in itself, you can go to any high school you want if you live in that district. You, you, you can go to McDaniel College, you can go to community college. There are just so many opportunities. Uh, and let's face it, Carroll County is probably one of the safest counties in the state. Our crime wave is real low. Uh, the opportunities are just here. It, there's a big difference. Tell us about the time when there was a um, swimming pool started in Carroll County by a gentleman from Jamaica for African Americans. Well, this was a little before my time. I don't know when it started. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, I think it was called a country club. It was called Scarlet's. It was off of Pool Road. Uh, I think this was back in the early 50s. Uh, uh, I was told that he had uh, horseback riding, swimming pool. Uh, I was probably three, four years old. I don't remember all that. Uh, my mother remembers going there, but it was supposedly an upscale country club uh, for African Americans. They had people coming from New Jersey, D.C., Virginia. Uh, it was supposed to be pretty, pretty nice. Uh, and what happened? Uh, I, I really don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. I was just too young to, that would be something that uh, Dixon, Richard Dixon, John Lewis, is someone of that era or someone older would know. I, I'm not familiar with that. And the all white uh, swimming pool, that was... Uh, well, there were several of those. <laughs> there were, there weren't any African American. Them? Well, when I, uh, I guess before during my college days, and we were, I think, I'm not even sure who was the president, but I remember John Lewis, uh, Robert and Phyllis Scott, uh, when they, we went to integrate the uh, Frock Swimming Pool there on uh, Bond Street. Mm -hmm. We were allowed to go in, but once we went in, there, there was no trouble. Uh, I think things were beginning to change before then, but this was one of the, the things that, that we were trying to do. So when we went to go into the pool, he allowed us in the pool. There was no one else in the pool, and that was it. A month after that, he filled the pool in. So there's no longer a pool afterwards. And why do you think he filled the pool in? Well, it's quite obvious why he filled it in. He didn't want to integrate the pool. So rather than have it integrated, uh, and rather than have a big stink, when we went there to integrate it, he let us in with no problems, and he just kept the whites out, and then we left. Uh, a month later, he decided to close the pool. He closed it, filled it in with dirt, and now they're building senior homes there. Well, tell us a little bit more about, um, first, you integrate. Did you try to integrate anything else with other African Americans back in the 50s in Carroll County? No, I was kind of young back then. I'm not as old as I look. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the only integration I participated in probably was in the later uh, 60s. In the early 60s, uh, I wasn't here. I was uh, living in Baltimore going to uh, Morgan University or Morgan College back then. And then after that, I stayed in Baltimore until 68, 69. So uh, I wasn't really a big part of integrating uh, Carroll County, only a few things. And tell us about your experience being the first African American um, on the board at the bank in Carroll County. Well, that was basically brought about by uh, Bob Scott, Robert Scott, who was a great innovator. He was a great civil rights person. And he was a big stockholder in Union National Bank. And he had approached me about being on a board. I'd never knew anything about a bank board. And so he talked to me and worked with me for five or six months. And he submitted my name to the board. And I guess he had enough influence uh, that I was voted on as a member of the board of Union National Bank directors. And this was, uh, I guess, the spring of 1991. And I remained on the board. Uh, for nine years, uh, 
At the end of my nine years, the bank was sold to Mercantile Bank. And through the transition I was on the board till we went through the final transition to Mercantile Bank. But the whole nine years, it was a different experience. Uh, a lot of folks were kind of surprised, didn't know how to take it, but I think I represented uh, our community very well. I was never outspoken or raised any fuss. I did my share, I participated, and, and today, last well, a couple of days ago, I had a conversation with Joe Beaver, who was the president then, and he again thanked me for participating on the bank board, and he said it was a pleasure serving with me. So I think it, it went over well. Carroll County was beginning to change then, and it's changing every day still. Okay. That was in 1991 that you stepped? Yes. Wow. That seems so recently. It, that it would is. Be, would be the first <laughs> in the 90s. Well, you got to realize Carroll County, when I moved back to Carroll County in 68 or 69, the population of the county was probably 64 or 70,000 people. Now we're, what, 170,000 people. So we've probably uh, more than doubled. And the, the people that are moving to the county now are middle, upper middle income. So to them, segregation, integration doesn't mean anything. It doesn't bother them. You know, it's all about being able to survive and get on with your life. So I, I think the difference is the type of people that are moving to Carroll County. And that's the basic thing. Education and accessibility makes a big difference. Okay, thank you.